welcome to the Shift Gold Friday Gold Wrap, your overview of this week's precious metals news. It's Friday, August 31st. I'm your host, Mike Meharry. Thanks for tuning in. Gold pushed back above $1,200 earlier this week and has managed to hold on despite selling pressure late in the week. This morning, gold is trading at around $1,204. Dollar weakness helped boost the price of gold early in the week. Most analysts attributed that to progress toward a trade deal with Mexico and some seemingly dovish statements by Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell in Jackson Hole last Friday. Peter Schiff did a couple of podcasts this week about Powell's comments. He thinks the potential for Fed dovishness was the big driver in gold this week. But later in the week, hawkish sentiment returned after the 4.1 Q2 GDP number was revised upward to 4.2%. Now, all of a sudden, Fed rate heights are back on track. Well, which is it? Nobody really knows. But if you consider what's really going on in the economy, particularly all of the debt, it just doesn't seem likely that the Fed is going to be able to raise rates a whole lot higher. Powell's Jackson Hole speech seemed to underscore that, as Peter pointed out in his podcast. Now, you could read into it that the central bank is getting close to ending the tightening cycle. I think we'll probably still get the September and December rate hikes, but you know, that very realistically could be it. Are the markets starting to figure that out? Powell basically said two things at Jackson Hole. Number one, he doesn't see much danger of the U.S. economy overheating. And number two, he sees a low likelihood that inflation is going to move beyond the Fed's 2% goal. He even praised Alan Greenspan for not moving too fast, raising rates back in his day, saying we should wait until we see the whites of inflation's eyes. Now, you can put this in the category of things that make you go, hmm, because inflation is already at like 2.9% according to official CPI numbers. And as I've said before, I think that understates inflation. So here we are. Rates are only at 2%, and we're already talking about normalized interest rates. Jerome Powell is afraid the mistake the Fed might make is raising interest rates too much, when, as Peter said, if anything, the mistake is that they haven't raised them enough, and really that they lowered them too much in the first place. In fact, that's what Powell should have been criticizing Greenspan for, lowering rates and keeping them too low for too long. But Powell seems to be more afraid of fighting an inflation boogeyman that doesn't exist. So he's saying he's not going to do that. He's not going to err on being preemptive when it comes to stopping inflation. But if for some unexpected reason inflation does spike up, well, then the Fed will do whatever is necessary to rein it back in. Peter did a really good job of summing up what's going on here. He said the Fed is basically backtracking on rate hikes that the market may have anticipated for 2019 by talking about how interest rates are closer to normal now, that 2% today is not the same as 2% in the 1990s, talking about not wanting to invert the yield curve, about waiting for the whites of inflation's eyes before they come out blasting by doing everything that it takes. The Fed has basically said it's just going to sit back. It's not going to be preemptive on inflation fighting. It doesn't think inflation is going to break out. But hey, if it's wrong, well, then it will do whatever it takes. Basically, the Fed's new attitude is why take an ounce of prevention when you can always use a pound of cure when it comes to inflation. But here's the problem. The economy can't handle the prevention, much less the cure. I've talked about this on a number of occasions. The central bank cannot push rates up very much more without bursting bubbles. There's just too much debt out there in the economy. So Powell is kind of between a rock and a hard place. He can push on and risk blowing up the economy, or he can sit back and let inflation go out of control. Anyway, based on what Powell has said, some traders might be realizing that the Fed is pivoting toward a more dovish position and beginning to price some of the later rate hikes out of the market. That would explain the sudden stock market surge. Investors are saying, yay, they're not going to take the punch bowl away. Well, I guess we'll see. Speaking of the trade war, there was some optimism this week because of a tentative agreement with Mexico and progress towards a new overall NAFTA deal. On a side note, it's really ironic that they call this stuff free trade. There's nothing free about it. I was reading some of the provisions on this deal with Mexico 
For instance, American auto companies that assemble cars in Mexico will also have to use more U.S.-made parts to avoid tariffs, which will help U.S. factory workers. And about 40% of those cars will need to be made by workers earning at least $16 an hour. That's three times more than Mexico's minimum wage. This is massive government intervention into the market on an international scale, not free trade. And these deals are riddled with this kind of stuff. Anyway, while there seems to be some progress with NAFTA, the trade war with China is raging on. Trump announced he wants to impose tariffs on $200 billion more in Chinese imports after a comment period ends this week. The world's two largest economies have already applied tariffs to $50 billion of each other's goods in what Reuters calls a tit-for-tat trade war. Talks ended last week without any major breakthroughs. Meanwhile, Trump took aim at the World Trade Organization this week. He said, quote, if they don't shape up, I would withdraw from the WTO. Trump has complained before that the WTO treats the U.S. unfairly in global trade. And that may well be true, but I'm not so sure threatening to withdraw is necessarily the best negotiating strategy. Of course, that's pretty much Trump's modus operandi. It's the bull in the china shop technique. Be as bellicose as possible to get people all anxious and upset and then bring them to the table, and then you negotiate from a a position of strength. And it works until somebody calls your bluff like Europe just did. So remember a while back when Trump was saying that the goal was no tariffs and everybody was all excited and they were saying, look, the president is free trade and he's just trying to negotiate from a position of strength. Well, Europe called him on the no-tariff policy, and the president backed down. EU Trade Commissioner Cecilia Malmström told the European Parliament that Europe was willing to cut car tariffs to zero if the U.S. was willing to do the same. Trump said, quote, that's not good enough, end quote. Yeah, he literally said that. Zero tariffs, not good enough. He said, quote, their consumer habits are to buy their cars, not to buy our cars, So basically, Trump wants to use tariffs to change consumer preferences in Europe, apparently. This is really telling. As Peter noted in a Facebook post, the president claimed his goal was zero tariffs. The EU offered just that, and Trump said no. This proves Trump does not want free trade or even fair trade. He just wants to protect inefficient domestic manufacturers from foreign competition, forcing U.S. consumers to pay higher prices. And this goes back to something I've said over and over again. When you hear the word tariff, you should always think tax. A tariff is a tax. I remember fondly the days when Republicans walked around saying, you don't tax yourself into prosperity. Well, just because you call an import tax a tariff doesn't magically change its fundamental economic nature. We are not going to tariff ourselves into prosperity either. Look, this trade war is costing you money. Yes, it's going to benefit some sectors of the economy, and it's also going to hurt a lot of sectors. That's why the government is spending billions of dollars to subsidize farmers hurt by tariffs. It's just basic economics. I was amused at a tweet Representative Justin Amash sent out in response to a Trump tweet taking members of Congress to task for criticizing his trade war with talk about free trade. Amash tweeted a photo of Henry Hazlitt's book, Economics in One Lesson, and told Trump he could pick up a free copy in his office. Incidentally, you can get a free copy of Economics in One Lesson online. I'll put a link on our show notes page. If I have angered you by criticizing this absurd trade war, you really should read that book. In other news, there's been a big spike in subprime credit card delinquencies. This could be a sign that the American consumer is close to being tapped out. As Wolf Street put it, quote, credit begins to unravel at the margin. In other words, America's borrowing binge could be nearing its limit. I'll link to an article about this in our show notes page. The bottom line is we may be getting close to the bursting of the bubbles. You want to be prepared now. One way to do that is to invest in precious metals. You can learn more about that by talking to one of our knowledgeable Shift Gold Precious Metal Specialists. Just call 1-888-GOLD-160 today. Well, that's a gold wrap for this week. You can get more details on all of these stories and more and keep up with the latest precious metals news and analysis throughout the week at shiftgold.com news. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to the Friday Gold Wrap podcast over at iTunes for free. 
There's a link on the show notes page. Thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you again next week.